DJ Sonic. Ah, okay. Fingers and toes crossed. Yeah, let's see. So, uh, so I was blabbing as we were waiting, and I was saying this is a first for us. It's um, to be doing this. You know, I, I will say though, people on social media, like the people that are following us, that we've got eighteen hundred people that have 19, 17, 98 people that are watching this right now. But they're terribly patient when it comes to Instagram Live because it is like it's a cluster getting on and staying on. <laughs> so it seems uh, well, you know, I, I watch news every day here, often Sky News, and it's interesting because everybody now has to do everything via video calls to see how how many fall and fail from places where yeah. you think they had the most perfect connection, but nah. I oh, know the BBC do that. It's like, I don't know whether they're cutting down on expenses, but the amount of people that are coming in on Skype calls or, you know. Well, it's actually anyway. So we go on. Well, I was just going to say, so we decided on Friday we were going to in order to sort of get this thing rolling. We were going to ask each other 12 questions, right, which personally, personally, I was obsessing about all the weekend. Like, what 12 questions should I ask him? And especially as there's really nothing I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, Johnny. You'd be surprised. <laughs> so I had to think in terms of, OK, pretend you don't know him. You know, pre pretend like you haven't, like, you know, walked this path with him since we were, how old were we when we first met? Uh, mere children. Mere uh, children. 11 and 13 or something, something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, so for people that are, I mean, people that are watching it, we, we sort of felt that we'd sort of get into this ourselves first. And then, and then you know, after a little while, if we run out of things, we're going to open it up and see what, uh, see what you, the you guys out there have to say and if there's any questions that you have to ask but are you seeing the comments nick uh yeah good i am all right well who wants to go first um who can go first johnny okay. since you've been obsessing over it <laughs> <laughs> okay i'd say would you say that you came from a musical family definitely not uh my uncle graham uh, my dad's brother he uh was quite handy on the organ. They used to go and play, uh, you know, play at the local um, bars, I guess. And uh, I think he thought it attracted the ladies at the time. Uh, but I don't think anyone else in, in my family ever played a musical instrument. Um, when we were starting, and we, we both wanted to play guitar, right? Yeah. And so I remember I got that uh, really cheap um, SG copy, yeah. which, of course, I still have. Um, and, uh, and I knew I didn't like it because it used to really hurt my fingers when I was playing bar chords. And I, nah, this isn't for me. Since having played other guitars since, I realized it was particularly that guitar and the right. gnar gnarly strings I had on it. But, uh, but no, I, I'm glad I discovered the synthesizer because for me, it's much more like being able to make sculpture um, or paintings than, than having to just keep practicing scales. It wasn't, I mean, you know, raising... Atlanta in Los Angeles and you know and seeing how parents here send their kid get their kids tuition for everything I mean everybody has some kind right. of musical some kind of athletic thing I mean in an, in our in our world it just wasn't a thing was it I don't think I know I no. don't I don't think I knew anybody that had music lessons you know certainly not at home I mean I, I don't know what do you remember about music class at school well I remember my teacher was called Mr. Hooker um, uh, which, which, you know, which was, was amusing. Worth some value at that time. Um, and, uh, yeah, the music lessons really, there was only one piano, which he commandeered all the time. And it was things like him hitting a note going, Dong, and then ding, and saying, can you tell me which is the higher note? So of course we'd always say, oh, the first one, obviously <laughs> the first one. Um, no, I didn't really learn much at school. In fact, I stopped music. I never continued with it after uh, I was about 12. And then the irony of all ironies, I found out several years later when we'd, um, we, we'd done okay that there was a great big picture of me in the music room at school. To, but hey, 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 you were um, the great success. You were the greatest <laughs> yeah, success the music the, room, exactly. the music department ever produced. <laughs> Oh dear, well, I hope something else came out of there. I hope they had fun and bought some new instruments because we used to play with sort of tambourines and uh, 
if you're really lucky, some some finger symbols. Yeah. But you did you, you did did music actually, didn't you, at school? But not uh, I, not we, for that long either. We, our, our our music teacher's name was Frederick Harvey Morris, and he was almost he was about six foot five, a really serious character, like like a little bit like Anthony Hopkins in The Remains of the Day. You know, like like drill cream back, like he'd walk into the class, like and just r- rule with an iron an iron fist. And and I remember the the classroom had every instrument of the orchestra around uh, around the room. And he and I remember like one of the first days, he said, "Okay, well, you know, if there's anybody that you know w- wants to learn any of these instruments, um, you know, now's the time to apply." And and the saxophone was up on the wall, and really the saxophone was the only instrument. That, that was kind of appealing, you know, that felt like, you know, contemporary. Well, saxophones, saxophones look great until you have to play them, don't they? And then I think it's the look of them when you play them. I, 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 I still sort of fear looking back at, at us in the Rio video, both sort of playing <laughs> sex. <laughs> but I guess, yeah, that, that hung on until then. Yeah, but they didn't teach saxophone is the point. He was right. like, no, no, we don't do the saxophone. And I think then there was like a whimper of like, what about guitar? Don't be ridiculous. That wasn't. Uh... I wonder what it's like now. I wonder whether kids sit there actually oh. with, with computers and, and learn well, how I, to make electronic dance music. Well, I went back to, uh, you know, I went back to my high school about three years ago and they, they wanted me to participate in the dedication of the new music room. And um, it's a free for all. You know, I mean, they're learning you know, they're learning Coldplay songs. And there was like, and, and, and there was one trio of kids that had like formed their own little green day. And they actually got wow. to like, they actually got to practice in music class. You know, they got, they had their own little room with a drum kit and amplifiers and that, and they got to do that. So I think, wow. I, I mean, obviously every school is different, but I think it's a very open church as opposed to when we were kids, it was like, it was either, it was like the classics or nothing. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. All right. So I guess I better ask you a question now, mate. Um, who's your favourite fictional hero? Oh, we've been at the Proust questionnaire, have we? Uh, a couple. <laughs> I, I did for you. I did the same thing. I, I You know, I'm going to have to go for James Bond. You know, I think, I, I, I mean, it, 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 it's like there hasn't been anybody that's come along <laughs> that, that, is, uh, that has replaced him. He's still... I mean, I think because of our our connection with Bond and the films, and it it plays. I mean, he's probably the fictional character, one of the fictional characters that has the biggest, you know, like presence in uh, in the culture, in pop culture, um, certainly since we've been alive. Um, and I think uh, you know when I was when I was growing up, actually, I mean, even when we started touring. I remember thinking there was a lot to, you know, there was a lot to learn from the way James Bond Did you read you know, the books? handled himself. You know, I've read about five of the books. Um, right. I've read a couple of them, but I read Casino Royale uh, and I think Goldfinger. Yeah. I mean, they're great books. You know, I mean, he's they're very yeah. different, though, aren't they? I mean, actually, actually, Daniel Craig's kind of closer to the Bond in the books than than any of the earlier ones, I think. Because he's much tougher in the books, isn't he? Well, I think Connery is pretty tough, to be quite honest. I mean, actually, Connery had been in the military and he was a professional boxer, you know. So I, I always felt I mean, I felt I felt Connery fit fit the mold, to be honest. And even though he was like, a, I think he was pretty rough edged. I think, he, you know, he came from I don't know exactly the slums of Glasgow, but I mean, he wasn't a middle class kid. You know, but they, yeah, I mean, they still really, my favorite Bond. They really buffed him up, you know, and he, he his accent was kind of non specific enough that it sounded as though he could have gone to Eton in Ox- Oxford, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Oh, um, yes. Okay. Um, well, well, moving through your childhood. <laughs> Go on. Was there any religion in your home growing up? Uh, weddings and funerals. That was about it. Um, yeah. No, but I, uh, I'm, you know, the way that I look at things, I'm, I'm much more into, um, science than I've ever been or ever will be into religion. I, I'm of course, incredibly open-minded about whatever 
anybody wants to believe in um, and they should follow their path but it's not really for me i like i like fact and logic and uh i don't know i like myths actually i like mythology more than i like religion um mm, 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 for me mm. it's caused too many problems and of course you know that's a long conversation we shouldn't get into but but it, there's too many things that it's the root of problems for and um uh, I, I, I just like peace and I like people being able to get on with each other. And so religion, religion's never, um, never been something I've really thought about for myself ever. I mean, ne ne neither of your parents, neither of your parents had any kind of a religious upbringing. You know, they, neither of them no. had any interests. None of your uncles, aunts, cousins, nobody. Uh, no, I think there are people in the family. I, I, they consider themselves Christians or Church of England. Right. Which really yeah. means... Uh, to a lot of people that you don't go to church so much. I mean, the irony of all of it is that is that I, I love churches, um, particularly yeah, old Gothic do. ones. And I spend more time when I'm in Italy going into churches and just staring in absolute wonder at what they created than than I do anything else, I think. Um, but it's purely aesthetic. Yeah. So nothing, I mean, the, nothing to do with what they do in there. The Catholic Church particularly was like the great patron of, of of the artist wasn't it for sure well they, they definitely own a lot of the best uh, pieces in in italy if you want to go and see a good caravaggio it's uh, most of them are hiding in churches if you were a painter or a musician and you wanted to work you you know and wanted to get paid for your work you probably had to work for a pope or a you know or a you know a monastery or whatever yeah or, yeah. or, or, a, or a particularly wealthy family um you know, the records for things, uh, for, for old masters and things that really, really date back to 15th, 16th century, most of the records are the church records. That's how you find out art. So that one, that one really is a Giuseppe de Ribera or that, that's a Caravaggio um, because they, they recorded everything, of course, when the amount of time it took and paying for it and who commissioned yeah. it. Um, yeah. So... It's, it's kind of amazing that, that, that they did keep those records. Extraordinary. Are you surprised almost? Do you find yourself surprised that you, that you have such an interest in, in, in that today and that, that, that particular aspect of the world of art? Not really, because I've always loved uh, Gothic things and yeah. Baroque. And, and so um, I, I'm, I'm not a minimalist. I, I've never really loved anything right, much about right, minimalism right. uh you know when I, when i go to see some friends apartments and there's sort of nothing in there but a a globe and a and, a, and, a, and an ashtray or whatever I, I i i find it well did you just move in um it, it doesn't work for me i, I like to have stuff mm -hmm. around and, and it, it's not that i particularly like clutter it's nice to have space too but but i um I, I think that the, the, the ornamentation of, of what what they did during those periods is, is just um, so beautiful mm. and work that people couldn't even dream about doing now. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, there's some quite remarkable ones, particularly in Italy. Yeah. And Spain, actually. There's, there's some magnificent churches in Spain, but, but Italy's what I think of first. I think people you know, would be... You don't think, go into churches so much, really, do you? you know, well, you know, I, I also, like you, I mean, I love, I love visiting, you know, churches in Rome and Florence. I mean, with that, right. I mean, you know, um, remarkable. And I, I you know, I, I, I do, I do like, you know, whether it's Cologne Cathedral or, you know, mm. churches in, in that I mean, beauty. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I mean, even, you know, close to where I live in Bradford on Avon, there's like a 12th century, this tiny little thing that uh, that is, it's remarkable. I mean, they're some of the earliest examples of uh, like civilization, aren't they? You know, certainly of like thinking, you know, and uh, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I do. Aside I, I, from the Mayans and the Incas, yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I definitely have to be careful. I mean, we, around, you know, I was raised Catholic, so I, right. I, you know, I've got, there's a lot of triggers for me around. <laughs> but around you, I, don't remember, I don't remember your dad being particularly no. religious. He'd sort of sit outside in the car and wait for your mom, wouldn't he? Well, that, that was the dichotomy. Is that, is that it? You know, is that, is that you know, you mom, mom, that. And, mom and I would go in there and we were, you know, we were going to be saved. 
you know, and what was going to happen? But why to couldn't him? you? But why couldn't you sit with Dad in the car? Well, I think towards, you know, I think probably after spending a bit of time with you, I, I probably did spend him, start spending more time in the car. I think it was a, I don't know. I mean, I was very, I was conditioned from a very early age. I mean, when I was a little, from when I was a Ruby. baby. Exactly, exactly. You know, learning to think for yourself, you know, God forbid. Yeah, I, I, I'm, it's not something that I, I, I ever feel like we missed. But uh, a lot for a lot of people, look, it's it's salvation, isn't it? Um, so, so you just got to do what works for you. Yeah. Let's have another yeah. question. Another question, crikey! Let's have a look. Um, uh, and we wonder wonder why, we wonder why we're not letting letting the, our people ask us questions. One just went by that said, "Nick, why are you British?" We'll <laughs> come back. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> um, it's because I don't drink tea or coffee. Uh, right, what's your average day like at the moment? What do you do from when you get up to through the day? Um, we get up pretty early. You know, we tend to get up around 7.30 and um, we don't, Gilo and I, we don't really talk to each other until we're both holding coffee. So, <laughs> and, so the first hour is like, you know, see what's good, you know, drink coffee, see what's going on in the greater world, like looking at the, you know, the news, we still take it. We still have a newspaper, you know, uh, and, you know, we're what do you get? Up. Do you get the New York Times or the LA? Yeah, we get the, we get the New York Times. I mean, I like, right. I like the graphics. Yeah, know? yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, it's exhausting, the, you know, the, the, the sort of political position. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and we'll kind of talk about things that, you know, I like the economist, like the daily download. It's like, you know, you can in like six points, what's what's happening today. Yeah, um, we'll kind of talk. We'll kind of talk about that, and then uh, then I'll probably go and I'll probably go to my church, my church, you know, for for an hour. I do that most mornings, and right. then I, I I mean I've I've had a lot of time on my hands. I've been uh, you know I've been painting a lot, and I'm you know and I'm doing my piano practice, and you know and lunch. You know I was never really a luncher, but like I've become a serious luncheon <laughs> participant. In, in uh, you know, in lockdown. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're long days. But, you know, it's been kind of nice. I mean, I feel this is the longest you or I have not gotten in an airplane, probably since we were, since Planet Earth came out. Yeah. Know? Which has it's been the longest time I haven't left London. Yeah. Which has been nice, you know. It's, I mean, I mean, in a way, it's been. I mean, I was going to get to the silver lining question right at the very end, but, but so, how about you? What's you? What are your days? Uh, how are you spending your days? Um, we well, you know I'm never really like going to bed too early. Um, so uh, I usually go to bed around two ish. Yeah. Um, and when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is email. Um. And then I, I sometimes I, I scan things, I scan some auctions, have a look at a few things online, see what's interesting, look at new photo books that have come out for, for about an hour. And then um, get up, maybe have some fruit. Um, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then usually I want to get out. I want to get outside for a while, uh, even if it's in the garden. Uh, I think being cooped up inside has been, has been some, somewhat strange for everyone, for sure. Um, and then in the afternoon, and, and have some lunch, and then in the afternoon, um, that's when I try and figure out something creative to do, whether it's been sorting through my photos, which has been the biggest undertaking, and actually the most soul-destroying thing I've done in a long time, just sort of sitting there going, tree, flower, car <laughs> um yeah i'm trying to sort them out because there's about two hundred thousand digital photos that have never been labeled and at one point i almost just pressed delete on the whole drive uh because it was driving me a little crazy but i'm getting there i'm up to about ninety thousand of them now wow so so that that that'll be really nice when it's done because actually being able to find things is, is pretty useful um, and, and I have a greater purpose with it because I want to do a few more books once I, once I have it um, all in order. Surprising what you find, though, because uh, that's like my diary, my photos. 
because yeah. everywhere we go, I've always t taken a camera as opposed to just my phone. Uh, mind you, a lot of those cameras were nowhere near as good as my phone is now. But um, but yeah, you find out that I've got the history of digital photography for sure, from the smallest, horrible little files to actually now enormous files with so much detail in. You can, you can go inside of the pupils in people's eyes. When, um, was your when was the first digital? When was your first? When did you well, start, I, first start I, using digital? Around 98, 99. Um, what, what album was that? <laughs> uh, well, it would have been what, for me. It would have been was Pop that? Trash. It was Pop oh, right, Trash. Right. So before, before the reunion, yeah. um, I was using digital. I, I regret not continuing further with, um, with, uh, with film because when I do see things that I took my camera out occasionally, it just looks so much better every time. There's no question about it. Even now, there's all these brilliant filters you can use that give things grain and depth and different focal distances, but, but they're not the same as 35 millimeter. Um, but I remember going into a shop when we were on tour on the reunion tour to get some film. And it said all over it, camera, film, film, camera, camera. It was in, it was in Amsterdam. And I went in there and I said, oh, have you got some uh, 400 ASA black and white film, please? And the guy looked at me, put his head on one side, and he said, what century are you from? <laughs> that was about it. I thought this isn't going to be easy anymore, is it? I mean, funny enough now that there are, there are several stores that uh, really – have lots of that stuff and, and specialize. So you know, I'm going to start taking some 35 millimeter again. Have you ever thought about, have you ever, have you ever done the darkroom thing? Have you ever thought about actually? Well, yeah, room? yeah. I, I, I wish that I had pursued it more, but it is quite a process. The darkroom thing, you, yeah. you, you've got to be Smelly able to too, I seem to remember. Yeah, you've got to spend the time. And that's what I do now digitally. It really is like a dark room because you're, you're playing with the same sort of parameters. Um, but of course, it's much quicker and you can save things. Uh, but being in the dark room is, is, is a fabulous experience. When I was in um, Tokyo, uh, the end of the last tour, and, uh, and I was filming um, the beginnings of the documentary on Japanese post-war photography, one of the places that I went to uh, with Gavin, a trusty cameraman, uh, was um, one of the, the, the great uh, developers in, um, in Tokyo. And, and he, he literally developed films for uh, and processed everything for some of the greatest Japanese photographers for 40 odd years, 50 years. And he developed something while we were there from a very rare strip of um, uh, 35 millimeter. And we watched it all come up and it was so magical, really beautiful. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that analog process, I, I, I still love. It's the same thing. Well, you've been painting, haven't you? I saw some of your paintings actually. Bobby showed me the couple of uh, paintings. Right. That were like, yeah, so the more um, abstract expressionism is what came to mind. John. Yeah, there's a few different a few different uh, avenues that I've been going down. It's been a crash course, really. You know, I've just been trying to get a lot of different, you know, uh, uh, styles. I don't know. Find, just try to find myself. But I, I have come to realize that actually there's no such thing as purely abstract expressionism. Everything is an express. You know, it's an expression of some, even however subconscious it is. You know, I, I get to the end of it and I go, oh, I get what that is, you know, and uh, it's been such a it's been interesting period because on the, it's been tremendous turmoil has been going on, you know, around us, you know, globally and nationally. I mean, there's been so, so much going on. And yet we've been on lockdown, you know, at home for the most part. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of turmoil. So I think there's that that is kind of you know, in almost everything that I've been doing. But, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I did the art school thing, you know, and I, I did a foundation course, but that's where we started the band. So, you know, it's kind of interesting almost to think in terms of picking up where, you know, what I might have done, you know, had I, had I gone down that road, you know, and had I spent more time and actually gone and done a degree right. course in art and what that would have been like and getting, being exposed. I check in with Nick Egan, actually, because Nick is like my closest friend who actually did that 
you know, and he did the art, arts degree course. And he always says to me, yes, Johnny, that's, that's good. It's good. But you need, do, uh, you need to get back to drawing, get back to drawing. And he keeps pushing me back to, it's one thing to like splash paint all over the place, but you know, it's also having that discipline of, you know, but, but, it, but it's fun though. And I think it's, I think particularly as we have, as what we do, uh, it's probably why you like photography, you know, our, the work that we do together and with the band is so collaborative, but it's actually nice to have an expression that is autonomous, that it isn't about, it's like you just do it and it's done. And nobody's coming in and saying, hmm, well, what about if you did the line like that or you did it like that? You know, I think there's some, I think it's quite healthy yeah. to have a, Oh, I love painting. I don't paint very often. If I felt I was better at it, I would paint more often. In fact, I may have gone down, down that route even very early on. But um, but I don't know. I usually end up hiding them. Yeah, so well. I finish, finish one, I just slide it away somewhere. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I think, again, that's been quarantine. You know, I'm in this, I'm in my room and I'm like, oh, you know what, I'm just going to put that up on the wall and see how it, oh, no, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. I was going to say, what, when, when did you, I mean, when did you realize that, that you wanted to make music? When I was 10. Um, it sounds somewhat ridiculous, but um, my, my mother can uh, attest to the fact. Um, yeah, it was when I saw David Bowie on top of the pops, pretty much on uh, Starman. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, well, first I wanted to be a magician, and then I wanted to be an astronaut. But that seemed really difficult. And then a musician somehow absurdly seemed closer. And and um, yeah, it was when I, when I when I saw Bowie, and then I I bought a few albums in that period. There was. The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust was the first one I got. And I got Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. Um, and then, well, then we sort of met around that period. And I, I loved Sparks and Cockney Rebel and T-Rex and, and and all those bands. And, and it just seemed, I don't know, colourful, exciting, um, much more exotic than the life we were living in the suburbs of, of Birmingham. And of course, my parents at the time said, well, oh, that's very nice, Nicholas. That's very nice. And then when I was 12 and I was still saying, it's, oh, well, you'll grow out of it. By the time I was 14, I was still saying the same thing. I think they started to get a little more concerned about it when we were going to a lot of shows everywhere. And then by the time I was 16, we formed the band. So yeah. So that was that. But they gave me a year. My, my parents were great, actually. They, they, they really um, supported me and well, and us very yeah. much so, as you know. But yeah. they said, right, you've got a year and see what you can make happen in a year. Yeah. If not, you go back and you go and do your A-levels and you can be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, that will be fine. Yeah. Um, but so we moved pretty fast in that year. Yeah. Uh, and then within two years, we we had the full lineup and we were signed to EMR. Yeah. Yeah, I'm forever grateful for that. They call it a gap year over here, you know, but the, <laughs> our parents both said, all right, all right, all right, we'll give you a year, you know, and not put, not, not make us get a job because it's quite difficult. And, and that's why we were able to get so much done. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it, it's true. I mean, like we're, we're learning how to play, learning how to find some kind of unique thing, some, something that some X factor were like in the, in, the, you know, and Ooh. we went through, we probably went through three singers in that year, you know. We definitely went through three. bloody singers. Yeah. 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 But I, but it was a special time. I I always remember Nick, uh, you know, that when we went um when we went in, you know, we used to go into Birmingham on Saturday, didn't we? You know, that was yeah. always a thing. We'd go and we'd go and look around the record stores and see what was happening and, you know, and I remember we used to go we often used to go into the Odeon. The Odeon was like the big venue, wasn't it, for sort of mid, yeah. you know, um before bands started playing in arenas and the like and i remember we went there and we were going to and it was when roxy were there and roxy music were playing a, a saturday and a sunday it was the country life tour and uh, we went in just to see what we went into the foyer of the of the odeon which was where the box office was and i remember we met those two kids Ma jeff and marcus and they said hey that you know they're doing a sound check 
and before and, and say, come and check it out. And we walked down the we walked down the side of the Odeon and you could hear the band playing. I mean, we had no idea what a sound check was at the time. You know, it was like they were rehearsing. And I remember, I, I always remember that, you know, and then they, they all came out, they got into a Mercedes, stretch Mercedes, and it was like, whoa, I mean, talk about astronauts, you know, it was like these guys were from another, from another planet, you know, I, and, and, and to this day, Phil Manzanera, I remember seeing Phil Manzanera, and I guess he must have had like seven inch platforms on, Phil Manzanera was <laughs> like a freaking Amazon, and, you know, and like, you know, then you meet him, and like, I'm taller than he is. You know, but at the time, these guys were like, wow, you know, heroes. Yeah. Yeah, they were quite difficult, those platforms, weren't they? I remember we, we, we caught sort of the end of that, didn't we, in the 70s? Yeah, I'm not sorry about that. You no. know, we, kind, we kind of came in on the resurgence of the Cuban heel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was a better look. Really. Yeah, and, and, and then those, do you remember those booties, those suede booties that were like, what were they the pixie called? boots. Yeah. Pixie yeah, boots. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I do indeed. I, do. <laughs> yeah. I think I had a, a, a sort of a burgundy suede pair of those somewhere. Yes, me too. Yeah. Time for another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, what, what, what possession do you treasure the most? Oh, well, let's talk about my birthday present. You know, and I, think I, I, I had the most oh. remarkable birthday present that arrived at my home about uh, eight, nine days ago, um, courtesy of my, of my bandmates, but primarily you. Well, uh, they, they, you, I, Bobby and I, our dear friend uh, Bobby, um, who, who put this together with us, my God, I really almost bit off more than I could, uh, I could chew with that one. <laughs> but... It's it's a remarkable thing. It is indeed. Let me tell you. Let me tell everybody what it is. It's a it's it's a jukebox. It's a 1959 AMI jukebox. I'm I'm actually looking at it. it it's 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 right uh, right there, well, and it's it it's it's the exact same jukebox that was in the Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood sex shop on the King's Road, and uh, most remarkably, it has exactly the same songs on it that were on the jukebox at Malcolm McLaren's shop on the King's Road. And, you know, famously, this juke I mean, there's some photographs of like those early punks like Jordan with that jukebox. And famously, one of the songs on there is Alice Cooper, uh, 18, which was the song that I guess when Steve Jones and Glenn Matlock, who both worked in the store, and they eyed this guy, Johnny Lydon, came into the store with his I Hate Pink Floyd t-shirt. And they said, yeah, you... You won't be a singer in our band, you know. And uh, he goes, "Oh no, I don't. I can't really sing. I mean, I could prance around." They said, "Well, why don't you? Why don't you mime to this?" And they pressed <laughs> the button, and so he goes mental around the store, and that's how he got the job in the Sex Pistols. But Nick, it's it's. I mean, talk about most treasured possession. I mean, this is up there. It's absolutely remarkable. And oh, um, no, I'm really pleased you like it. it. It it's it's like the DNA of uh, yeah uh, of of pop music from, from that period, because it's filled with these incredible things from the sort of fifties, sixties, just stretching into the beginning of the seventies. And when you listen to all the tracks as, as Bobby and I were, and they were coming in, it's amazing because you say, ah, so that's where they got their sound from. Oh, and that's just like that song. And wow. So the, the synth on that's quite like one of those songs. It's really something, but, um, but yeah, yeah, it was, I think, it was a tricky one finding all those. I bet. I mean, I mean, McLaren, you know, obviously, you know, one of the most important iconoclasts for us, you know, and he you, you, you just keeps you guessing all the time because because you go, oh, yeah, well, I get why that's on there. What's that doing on there? Right. And you can't quite put it down. And there was that there was that T-shirt that he did, you know, like the, the list between like who was in and who who wasn't in. And it's it's very tricky with him. You know, he must have been a really interesting guy to have been around back then because, like, oh, his, yeah, sure. you know, his enthusiasms, what he was for, and somehow what what made somebody okay in his eyes, but what made somebody definitely not okay in his eyes, you know, and you really get that on this because it's such a yeah, yeah, yeah. it's such a fascinating mix of of music. Oh, I, it keeps you on your toes constantly when you're you're scrolling down and just when you think you've oh i've got it i've got what he's tasted something you see something and you're like what the hell is that doing there 
Yeah, but he was never afraid of trying something different, was he, Malcolm? I, I, you know, it's so sad that, that he left us um, some years far too early. Because um, he, 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 he was really something. Uh, he was fascinating to chat to. I spent a bit of time with him. And, uh, and yeah, I really, um, really enjoyed the way that he looked at the world. Um, um, just fantastic ideas and as a conceptionalist he he, um, he knew how to put different things together unlike anyone else but you know who his favourite artist of all was which Billy I Fury. found out during this yeah yeah Billy Fury that, that was what he you know he loved more than anything you, you would never have thought it would you during the Sex Pistols time really right. But, right. But, but yeah that was, that was his superhero what's your most treasured possession um wow difficult one uh photographs i think generally and not not specifically things that i've taken old photographs family photographs yes um photographs of uh i don't know things that i've loved things i've collected some beautiful surrealist photographs that i i just look at all the time and i always see something different in them it's that freezing of one moment in time, one, something that's never going to happen ever again, yet it's there for as long as somebody doesn't ruin the photograph or the negative. I mean, that um, had to be one of the greatest um, things about photography when it came along, that you could, you could keep this memento of somebody that, that had passed, you know, that you could, you could have a photograph of a parent or a grandparent, and it would just... You, you, you could keep it forever. Before that, there was nothing, really. I mean, Well, a know. lot of people, a lot of artists thought painting was dead when photography happened. Yeah. Because yeah. what was the purpose of painting if you didn't have to preserve the portrait or what a room looked like or the view, if you could just do it by, by taking a photo? Well, of course, it didn't quite pan out like that, thankfully. But, yeah. um, no, I love photographs. I, I mean, I don't know. In, in other ways, I... Possessions, my computer, purely because I'm so reliant upon it. Um, it's not something of great beauty. Well, actually, it is. It's an apple, so it is of great beauty. But but it, it's a different a different kind of thing. Um, but it's what you can do with it. Uh, I mean, if you were having to leave the house and it was on fire, what would you take with you? Yeah. Uh, I guess I would grab my computer just because... It would be such a nightmare having to mark well, backups of it, as long as the backups weren't in there. Yeah, and you can put and you can scan the old photos. And I mean, I've got you know, but I did lose my computer. You know, I lost my That's computer. Right. Oh my god! I, yeah, but I, you I, had I, a backup, I, didn't you? Well, I haven't found it yet. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there's there's something about that. I, I told you, I nearly did it with the photos, and of course, I wouldn't have really that done it. But it sweet. did it it did sort of yeah, it did cross my mind. Do I really need all these photos? Yeah, right. Um, it, it takes up a lot of digital space, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's never going to end. That's something I was thinking about the other day, about how ridiculous our storage capacity is mm -hmm. becoming in the world now, because there won't be any need to delete anything as, as we move forward. So there's just going to be... <laughs> that's your dream. <laughs> well, it, it's a dream, but it's also a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, people were saying about photography, well, with digital photography and particularly with film, we'll have a much better record of the world and the way the world is because we've got everything from every angle and um, there's loads of photos that exist of incidents and particularly with people carrying phones. Um, so uh, it's going to be better. But of course, what's happened is nobody prints anything anymore. So you end up with this world where we used to have several prints of events, whether it's man landing on the moon or it's something from the end of the war or there are images that you remember. And there are actually prints of those things out there. A lot of them are in museums or um, collections, but the, there's, there's prints that exist. Now, everything is digital. Because we change formats mm -hmm. so often and now it's Firewire and now it's Firewire 3 and USB 3 and then this has changed and that doesn't fit in there anymore. People are losing 
huge swathes of, of, of their work or their uh, mementos of things. And that's happening right across the board, too. Um, I'm assuming that the, the, the bigger companies have, have really got their storage sorted out better. But, but I've been finding that out when I've been logging my photos. And that's just my little lot, which is plenty of them. But mm. how mm. difficult mm. it is. And, and I, I really sort of promised myself when I finish it that I'm going to make prints uh, of things that I like so that they exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think's the uh, the best thing about doing what you do? Um, freedom to create stuff. Um, I like making things. That's that's my um, my greatest desire is to make a song or make a sound or make a photo or make a painting or to make a little film. Um, and I like doing all of them. Of course, songs are what have driven us mostly. We've been so lucky, though, to work with other people. I like collaborating, too. Uh, I think some of the things we have been able to do have been um, incredibly special. And we've, we've been lucky. Uh, you know, I remember when we went to see, um, we went to see Eraserhead the um, David Lynch movie at the Arts Lab in Birmingham when we were teenagers. And it completely blew me away. I, I don't think my life was ever quite the same after that movie. Just that somebody had made a movie like that and taken the time and put that much detail into it and how beautifully strange and bizarre it was. And there it was on the screen. And, uh, you know, who would have really thought that all these years later, we would have ended up making a movie with David Lynch, uh, um, a live film uh, of our show with David Lynch. It's, it's, it's strange, the journey that life takes you on. But, but some of the people we've collaborated with, many of the people we've collaborated with, Niall Rogers, um, uh, Mark Ronson, um, you know, a, a lot of the producers we've worked with, it's great getting being around that energy and and seeing other people's views because everybody looks at things from a different space, don't they? What's the worst thing? The worst thing? Um, not sleeping. Uh, not sleeping. I, uh, I've been an insomniac yeah. for many, many, many years, but and actually I'm not sleeping quite so badly at the moment. It's quieter. There's less planes. That, that's one of the things that wakes me up all the time. But no, it's usually because I, I can't so slow my my thinking down enough. Um, but yeah, I, I hate getting up feeling tired in the morning. It's a small problem to have. Yeah. What about you? What? No, no. What's the best and what's the worst? Um, well, I well being an only child. I think uh, I think having that brotherhood that we had at the very beginning, it was like it was like suddenly it was like suddenly having like four brothers, you know, which was kind of great. And then we kind of got to go around the world as a posse. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I, I, had to, I had to get a passport to, to travel with the band. I'd never I'd never, uh, you know, I'd never left the country before. And, um, you know, and I think that the first couple of years, particularly to have those experiences of going to places like Japan and New York and Australia, Paris, you know, but doing them en masse, you know, was uh, mm -hmm. a really, really fun way of, um, uh, of uh, you know, of seeing the world for the first time. Um, for sure. The worst thing, um, maybe that you can lose yourself in, in the, you know, in the, you know, the same as the, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 whatever it was, uh, I don't know. I feel like we've got a pretty good balance today, haven't we, between uh, church and state, you know, between, you know, so. what's, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I don't know. I guess we, I guess if we're gonna, I mean, the comments are really bizarre. 
Some of them are really bizarre. But uh, I, I, they keep saying, hey, you know, what are these stupid questions? And, you know, it's like where, where we could be answering questions about what's your favorite B-side. But, hey, uh, would you say you were materialistic? Uh, not really. Only with art, I suppose, somewhat. I like collecting things. You do? Yeah, but it's not. Um, I think the collecting of them is half of the fun of it. But I just, I, I like having stuff around for inspiration really i have so many books because i'm always referring to things to see what this was what's that graphic design what's this um what's this artwork from what's that um you know what were the ballet russe doing then it, it's it's inspiration for me um but otherwise, I don't, I don't particularly, I don't covet things, um, yeah. not at all. It's, it's only things that, that really inspire me, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, why don't I ask you something much more trivial? Like, what's your favorite flower, Johnny? God, I almost feel like I need to, like, like call a friend for the answer <laughs> to that one. Uh, <laughs> You must have some in your garden. I mean, this has been quite a good period for, for plants. We've really, you know, we've spent, we've spent quite a lot of time in the garden this last few months. And we've actually gotten to know a lot more about about trees. And we actually got a couple of small magnolia trees and planted them just outside. Which I love was, magnolias. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... <sighs> I mean, can I say roses? I mean, I'm sure I could come up with something, you know, more interesting. I, I like I like flowers with a scent, definitely. Um, I mean, I think that if it was a desert island situation, I would probably go for a rose. I love the texture of rose petals. You know, it's very, it's a very rich, quite velvety. Um, but you know, I'm a, I'm I'm a bit of a, you know, I'm not the most sophisticated florista. How about you? you? Are you still an orchid uh, orchid guy? Oh, well, yeah, I love flowers. I, I'm, I, I'd probably go for peonies, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Some, um, a, a dear friend of mine sent me the most beautiful peonies for my birthday this year, and I, I just watched them. I actually photographed them a lot because every day they, they, they changed. The light was different on them, and they have the most beautiful death of all flowers. Just extraordinary, exquisite. Yeah. So I, I think probably peonies, but I like lots of lots of things, orchids, um, rhododendrons. As we remember, rhododendron is a nice flower. Yeah. yeah. Evergreen, it lasts forever. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, what living person do you most admire? Wow. Um, my mom. Oh. I do. Uh, beautifully, because, beautifully said. Uh, well, but, but, you know, she's pretty extraordinary. And and uh, I wouldn't be here without her, so I admire her for putting up with me. But, but, but you know, she's. I've always had a great relationship with my mom. And, and I, I feel very, very lucky um, that... She's always sort of been there as a, as a wise um, person in the background to try to sort of just mention occasional things, you know, it could be about anything, could be about something we were all doing together, something that I was doing in my life or just a, a little bit of advice on something. And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Love it. Definitely. It's, it's, it's tricky though, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're, um, what, what, what do you miss about England when you're in America? The architecture? Yeah. Um, that sort of, uh, that sort of pragmatism that the English have, you know, there's, a, there's, you know, like England's been around a lot longer than America you know, and it's, it, it, you know, and I feel that it's a lot, I, the cynicism, you know, the sarcasm, you know, the yeah. anti-authoritarianism. Yeah, that never know, really like traveled, did it across the ocean. We don't, we don't trust anybody, you know, and, and, and if it's coming out of a politician's mouth, we assume it's bollocks. And it always has been, 
you know, we have very, we put very little stock in authority, you know, um, you know, you get over here, but it's a lot, a lot more precious, you know, the conversation, I mean, people, re you know, it's like the difference, you know, Americans really believe that like their vote, their right to vote is the most important thing that they have, you know, I mean, I love the fact that there's no, there's no like, aristocracy that i love about america you know that there's no glass ceiling that that actually anybody can become the country's top person even if it's just for four days but you don't you don't have to have been born into it you know and you don't have to you know go to eden yeah. um no i mean they're, 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 they're it's a wonderful contrast actually between between the two i mean i'm i'm actually you know looking forward i'm looking forward to i'm coming coming back for a few weeks and I'm quite looking forward to it because the conversation here has just been, it's been so intense. Um, I'm yeah. looking forward to a break from it, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's different, isn't it? It's a different, it's a different kind of conversation over there. Yeah, but uh, obviously we're preoccupied with very much the same subject matter as everybody else right now. Um, I think if you opened a news channel, that didn't mention politics or the virus, you you get a lot of viewers because it's let's it's do very, it let's do it. It's very it's very <laughs> intense every day, um, and it really is nonstop. I, I tend to watch several hours of news throughout the day just because I I like to know what's going on anyway, and so I I'll have it on in a room and then I'll wander in and watch it for a while, turn it off, come back a few hours later. But honestly, it is pretty much the same thing, just from different points of view, as it as it uh, the levels change everywhere in the world. Um, but it, it's it's um, it's difficult to get away from yeah. from um, the horrors out there right now, for sure, for sure. Um, I tell you what, I miss most about America: air conditioning. Uh, is it really Is it really ne necessary in England? Is at the moment. Is it? Is it? Yeah, it, it's brutal at the moment. It's um, I don't know. I guess it's thirty-five degrees or something, or thirty-seven degrees, but it's very humid and uh, yeah, swampy. Okay, I got a good one. Go Brian on. Eno or Brian Ferry? Brian Eno. <laughs> 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 Uh, I like both Brian's. Um, it, what you meant was with a Y or with an I. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, let's have a thing. So, well, here's a question for you that I don't even know the answer to. Who's your favorite bass player? Well, it's got to be. Oh, actually, I did. Yeah, it's got. I mean, it's got to be Bernard. Bernard. Yeah, 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 really, yeah. Because he was the first bassist yeah. I, whose work, who I became really became aware of as a bass player, and right. like you know, when we were getting things going. What about aside thought, from him? Well, what he turned me on. Me? Well, he turned me on to James Jamieson, who was the Motown right. early Motown bassist, and, yeah. you know, and he started off on upright, and then he w went to electric, and he's really, you know, on, on all the, you know, the, most of the great Motown. Motown songs. He he was the bassist. I mean, I like you know I like McCartney. I like John Wetton, who played with Roxy on that that very tour. You know, I mean, he's he's amazing. He played with King Crimson for a while. Um, yeah. Um, who else? Mick Kahn. I always liked. Yeah, yeah, he was great. He was fretless, wasn't he? Wasn't he yeah. all fretless? Who's your favorite keyboard player? Um keyboard players i don't know really um all of craft work i suppose um well, they, were, they were inventing their own keyboards right i mean that's one of the yeah. things about that yeah things. yeah but, but i mean I, the, the experimental people Eno, obviously um was a big influence i think what he did on with roxy on the first couple of albums was was really inspirational and then the the solo albums the ambient ones and and the and the regular albums have all got great stuff on them. Um, there are a few I, I like. I like Wally Badaroo, who's uh, who's yeah. on Talking, um, Heads. Talking Heads stuff. Yeah, Ke yeah. Grace yeah. Jones and Grace Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think he's got a real 
great sense of rhythm and style and taste. It sounds, uh, a, a lot of keyboard players that play things, it's the sounds they choose that just they're like chalk on a blackboard for me. So I, uh, I need to find people who I like the sound they make as well. Um, but I, you know, I, I, there's lots of bands. I, the Pet Shop Boys, I love the Pet Shop Boys. I don't love all their digital sounds, but I, I you know, I think what Neil and Chris did um, is is really something. Um, and um, you know, generally their records sound great. Whenever I hear one um, from whatever period, I think, what's ah, yeah, that sounds great. Well, I feel like if I was the um, captain of this flight, I'd say we are approaching our destination and we'll be landing in six minutes. So oh. perhaps you want to put your uh, tray table away and put your seatbelt on. <laughs> what music do you both listen to at the moment is a question. Let's just quickly. You... Uh, well, actually, the last thing I listened to was Chopin's Nocturnes. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I mean, a, 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 a lot of classical, quite honestly. Um, I mean, I put a party mixtape together, so there was like a lot of, I've been listening to a lot of Cool and the Gang, sort of 70s into the 80s dance music. But I do, I do, I listen to a lot of like Chopin and classical. Mm. I think it's, it's less triggering, you know, it's mm. like music, but, you know, a, a lot of the time if I listen to music with bass and drums, I just get frustrated and I want to go and make music right away. Actually, um, I saw I saw um, I saw Mark Ronson in in London um, the other night, and he sent me a mix he's just done for um, a remix for Dua Lipa yeah. with Gwen Stefani on it, which um, ah, right, right, right. was fun too. Yeah, uh, but that's that's the most uh, that's the most up to date thing I've heard uh, this week. I don't think it's even out yet. Actually, maybe it is. Gerard H underscore seven eight zero three says new album question mark it's a very good question gerard <laughs> uh, <laughs> i mean actually the new album is in great shape it was a shame that everything happened as it did because i think we were about two to three weeks away from completing everything apart from mixing um we've got about nine mixes now that are very close i think yeah. uh I've been in the studio a little bit with um, Errol Alcan, who we've been working with, just to finish off a few little bits of my um, synths. And that, that's all shaping up very nicely. Uh, Mark Ronson sent through the part the other day for, um, for the guitar on the, uh, the second track we've done with him, which sounds great. Um, I must send you that, actually. Um, it's really, really good. So put that together in the studio and I'm going to go in again, to, you know, over the next few days and just try and piece together everything we've got and send it out to everyone. So we can all see how close we are. Great. Um, it was great working with Giorgio Moroder, wasn't it? What a it was. thrill. Oh yeah. Amazing. What a thrill. Yeah. A it maestro. Was like finally having a date with that girl that you had a crush on in sixth form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of kids, a lot of people want to know what's going on with your ceiling. Oh, it's falling down. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just kind of like it. Like, uh, Somebody was some, got some birthdays today. I missed it. It went past. But happy birthday if it's your birthday today. Yeah. Um, I love it when people say, hey, I'm 17 and you're my favorite band. Whoa. <laughs> no ceiling roads very funny um okay come on now's the time now's the t violin or harp nick violin uh or for me harp. Oh, i love both but violin actually I, i've been i've been working recently with um with a fabulous artist called wendy bevan and she plays violin um creepy goth violin just the way i like it and it's really been quite quite inspiring to to actually have that sort of live instrumentation. I'm so used to playing violin parts on on keyboards, but of course the beauty of of actually having the bow move across the strings and uh, and create this incredible sound with effects and things too. So it's very modern, um, beautiful violin violin. Yeah, me too. 
Me too. Um, well, you visited Athens, Greece. Can you say hi to Andrea? Hi, Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Uh, favorite keyboard. Would you do a virtual concert? Uh, yeah, I think maybe if things don't get any better, then, then we should play some music. Uh, I, I, I don't love the format, really. I don't think many musicians particularly do. It's not the same as having a, a live audience in front of you and having that kind of interaction. But it, it's, um, I think some of the people that have done them uh, have, have had some success with them. Uh, I, um, I, I, I wasn't here at the time to see it, but I would have liked to have seen the Nick Cave one. Uh, he, he did, um, I think, yeah. just with his piano yeah, at Alexandra Palace. I thought that was a beautiful idea. There was a there was a question that just flew past that I just can't resist, which is, what tattoo would you get, Nick? I wouldn't. <laughs> no, it's uh, I, I I don't mind other people's tattoos, but it's not for me. No. I think you've got to be you've got to be in America more. People do get tattoos here now, and it's growing. But it, it's for me, it's a West Coast thing more than more than anything else. Mm -hmm. It was definitely like passe when we were kids, wasn't it? You know, I mean, like the the bus driver would you know have you know mom an anchor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's. No, it's it's a look, isn't it? I, I, I don't like the idea of being stuck with something for life like that. Uh, I, I like to have an option uh, to, to change things. I know you can get rid of them, but I think that's quite a painful process, isn't it? So not for me. Sorry. Well, uh, th I want to say thanks to um, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Would you say tuning in? Not really. Tuning in, tuning out, whatever you like, really. Thanks for everybody to, for watching. And it's great to spend. We haven't spent this much time together in a while. We haven't, Johnny. No, 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 no. Mind you, those Zoom calls, they can eat away your life, can't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the insights. I feel I know you better now. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, well, thank you to everybody out there. It's been fun to spend some time with you, even though we can't see any of you. We keep seeing you scroll through the During pages. Duran Appreciation Day. Indeed, yeah. Apparently, since two thousand and three, I think. Unless anyone wants to correct me out there, so I love it. Thank you love all it. for all being there. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Love you. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Bye. See you soon. Bye.